Our scripture lesson comes to us from the letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter beginning at the 15th verse. Listen for God's word for you. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you and remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, and so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the work of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and made him head over all things for all the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who, fi who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. This Sunday is Ascension Sunday. It's the Sunday uh, right before Pentecost, and it's the Sunday after um, the, the days that Jesus was with the disciples after his resurrection, and he was with them, again, teaching them and helping them to understand what had happened through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then he goes on to, to be in heaven, and there leaves the church to become his presence in the world. And we usually often read the scripture that comes at the beginning of Acts where uh, Jesus ascends and he says that, that, that we are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, if you will, in our hometown, in the place where we are, in Judea, that we have a, a mission that reaches out beyond just this community, from Jerusalem to Judea, and then to, the, to Samaria, to the places that are beyond us and that are other, and then to the ends of the earth. A ministry that's to send us forth to, to care for and to spread the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. On this Sunday, most of the time, I've usually talked about that, kind of an ever-expanding circle that uh, God seeks to have influence in and to use the church as a ministry in that way. But I was thinking, uh, as I read through all the different scriptures that were for today, and the Ephesians scripture was there, uh, I was thinking about how in my own life, the person of Jesus has taken on very different meanings at different times. And I thought maybe I would spend a little time uh, this morning kind of talking about my own faith and how it has grown and matured, and how through different periods I've understood the ministry of Jesus in different ways. It's kind of that question that, um, that, that was posed um, maybe to, the, to, to scholars to try to figure out who Jesus is. And they try to answer that question in a variety of ways. One is to look at who was the group of people that Jesus associated with. And if you look throughout the New Testament, you kind of look at his teachings, Does his, do his teachings fit with any particular community more than another? Um, in Jesus' day, we, we know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we hear about them in the, the New Testament, but there were two other groups that were uh, also around. There were the Essenes and there were the Zealots. And let me just take a moment to break down who each of those were. The Pharisees were those who were teachers of the law. And Pharisaic religion came about whenever the temple was destroyed, the people of Israel were sent off to faraway lands to live, and they had to try to figure out now, what does this faith we have mean? And what they had were the laws. 
And so they would gather together on the Sabbath in places that they had never had before because the temple was the primary place for worship. They would gather into what they called synagogues. And they would meet to talk about the law and to teach the law and what it meant and how this relationship with God, if they followed the practice of the law, would keep them in a right relationship. Now, in Jesus' day, there were two groups of Pharisees. One were called the Hillel, and the other were called Shammai. The Hillel were those who believed in what they would describe the intent of the law. The Shammai believed in the letter of the law and that you keep yourself in a right relationship either by living by the intent of the law or by the letter of the law. And those two were basically in debate for uh, a period in which Jesus lived. And sometimes you hear Jesus uh, talk and he sounds like he might have been a part of the Shammai group where he would say, uh, um, you know, well you've heard it say this, thou shall not kill. But I say to you, anyone who looks with anger in their hearts at their brother is already as if they've killed. And, um, or, you know, if, uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, he would say. Uh, a very strict kind of understanding of the, the law. But, um, so sometimes he kind of comes down in that way. But other times, he sounds like someone who would have been more about the intent of the law than about the particularities of the law, the letter of the law. And, and, and so you might say, well, he probably would have sounded more like he were a part of the Hillel community in that way. The Sadducees were those who worshiped in Jerusalem because they had rebuilt the temple. And these were the people of power within the institutional religion. And they were the ones who uh, controlled the, the worship practice at the temple and the regular response. Most uh, uh, people practicing Judaism at that time would have had three times a year that they would have tried to make sure that they came and were at the temple for, for the practice. And if you look at Jesus, his life in the Gospels, it seems that he practiced that as well. He would always be at the temple during those times. That's why he was in Jerusalem at the time whenever uh, he was crucified. It was because he was one of those who practiced such faith. The Essenes were those who, they were the countercultural group, but maybe not in the way that we think about countercultural. Uh, they were the group that were, were so against the Romans having control or any influence in society that they withdrew. They pulled themselves apart out into the wilderness and they set aside a new community, a new way of living together out of what they understood God's calling in their life. They were the Essenes and they were separated off. And sometimes when you hear Jesus talk, he can sound kind of like that. He can sound like one who would want to pull off away and live by a very different value than the world would teach us and the world would give us to practice. We know he, his, his, uh, his baptism was a practice that baptism was a practice of the Essenes. Uh, John the Baptist probably was an, Ess an Essene, and he probably had connections that way. Then there were the Zealots, those who were believed that God wanted to overthrow the political leadership of the world in which they lived. And they were the ones who wanted to try to throw out the empire of Rome, who had come in and taken over. They were the ones who held the people down. They wanted to cause a revolt. Certainly, some of Jesus' followers thought that he was this kind of leader, a zealot to come and to overthrow Rome and to bring about a new kingdom of God. His teachings sound that way sometimes. So scholars kind of debate and they try to figure out where it is that Jesus lands. I guess for me, the question really is kind of like um, Jesus asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And while I preach every Sunday or nearly every Sunday, uh, there aren't too many times that I've often disclosed uh, in a real personal way kind of my own faith uh, development. There are times I'll talk about myself. I'll, try, I'll tell stories, and, and hopefully it's never just 
that it sounds like I'm just, oh, here goes Scott talking about his life again or whatever he does, you know, chasing that dog around or whatever, you know. It, it, hopefully it's not about that. Hopefully it comes across as, as sharing my own understanding of faith and how I experience it in a way that you can connect with it. And, but when I grew up in the church, and, and I did, I and mean, we were in church every Sunday, we were in church every time there was any children's program or any kind of event going on, fellowship dinners, we were there. I, I just remember uh, church was a comfortable place. It was a place that uh, I, I felt like I was at home. And uh, Chris and I talked about this a time or two uh, in his kids, and he says, you know, sometimes I, I wish they didn't feel so comfortable in the church because they just don't treat it with the respect that it needs, you know? And, and, uh, and, and I said, I would much rather his kids, our kids, feel totally at home here than to feel scared to be here. And, um, and that, that, I think, is an important thing. I remember so clearly, it was, I was in first grade, and the Sunday school teacher was teaching about who Jesus is, and she taught us this word. I, I'm sure I mentioned it before in a sermon, but she said that, that Jesus is the rabbi. That was the, the word that we were to learn. The whole lesson focused on that word, and I remember connecting to it so strongly that Jesus was teacher. Jesus was the one who taught us about God, who taught us about life, and our faith, and that was my primary image of who Jesus was um, in my growing up. Jesus was rabbi, he was teacher. For many children, Jesus is the same as God. But in understanding that word rabbi, I understood that, that Jesus points us to God in that way. And, and it became an important part of understanding uh, not only who Jesus is, but who God is in relationship to, to Jesus. Jesus is our, our teacher, the one who helps us understand the lesson. So that Jesus would teach with stories just seemed like a very natural thing for me in my understanding. Certainly fit for the church I grew up in. The thing I would, if I could remember anything about church and, uh, and, and sermons, it would have been a story, stories that the, the preacher told. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you get shocked a little bit as a kid, and that's the, the thing that you remember. I'll never forget, maybe the first sermon I remember, Dean Brown was our pastor, and he had what he called his God damn God sermon. And it was about a person who has gone through such great tragedy in their life. And they were suffering in the midst of it. And the way that they wanted to just yell out was to say, God damn you, God, for what I'm going through. And I remember, gosh, I was shocked as a kid to hear those words in church. But that God is not afraid of our rage God invites it. God invites us to, to bring the fullness of who we are. When we are disappointed in life, God wants to know it. When we uh, are joyous in our life, God wants to know it. God wants to know all of our life. I remember those. I remember, too, uh, last year, I don't remember. It seems like maybe he was here as a pastor associate at one time. I can't remember. But Les, uh, uh, I don't remember too much about him. But I remember that in the children's sermon, when we would all come up front here, every, every week you got to pick three animals. And I remember the week I got to pick a dragon. I remember that in church, you know. We, we have just such, you know, we piece together little parts of it in our memory of our understanding. But that he took that and then made it into a part of the story. I remember as I grew up looking at Jesus as maybe then more a moral example. Jesus was the one who lived the right kind of life. He was the one who healed those who were broken. He was the one who uh, taught us about how we are to live in terms of, of wealth and poverty and how we are to understand a responsibility for each other in society and in community, that we are to care for the poor. We are to visit those who are in prison and those who are alone and sick. He, he gave us the image of how we are to live. He was the moral example. And you could look at his life and you could see it. 
Jesus was a person who, who whenever anyone who was a mean, had means in their life and wealth, he would address them in that place. And if a person had nothing, he would address them in that place. And everyone was of equal value to him. He taught an egalitarian way of approaching life and how we live. And that was a beautiful thing. It was about the example of who Jesus is. It helped me understand social responsibility. It also helped me understand that whenever um, we, our church did our, our vacation Bible school for the summer, we taught it in the church. We had kids from all over the place and our community and neighborhood come. And after that week of vacation Bible school was over, the teachers decided it wasn't enough to just do it that one week for ourselves. And so we drove to Northeast Oklahoma City and did Bible school in a housing project there. And I went with my mom because she was one of the teachers and I was the only white kid there in the project for the, the Sunday school or the vacation Bible school. But I understood that it meant that, that um, this gospel had something to do with all of us being equal and all of us being one in the sight of God. We learn these lessons in small ways. We learn them being a part of church as we grow up. I learned about the social gospel and responsibility for one another. As a young adult, going on to seminary and feeling a call to ministry, I remember understanding that, uh, that, that the values Jesus lived by really were countercultural values. They were different than the world taught. And what we experienced in the church was something totally different and that the church was to be a contrasting model to the world of how we can live. Not by power, not by influence, not by status, but by love. And that that was the shaping, guiding principle. That kind of love that was a part of this countercultural community. And Jesus was the leader of that community. He was the leader of the body of Christ. I came to experience who God was in many ways more by the people of the church than I did from any transcendent religious experience of who Jesus was. It was through the love and care and practice of fellow Christians that I understood the true nature of Jesus during those days. It was, was an important part in, in my own formation because it, it had to matter. It had to matter in how I lived and how we live with each other. And that was a big part of my own understanding of who Jesus is and, and was. Um, I remember finishing seminary and come to pastor my first church. I love that church, um, but there were a lot of real life lessons in that first experience. It wasn't all as idyllic as the way I expected it to be. I learned that, uh, that you know, the reason church uh, works is because Jesus uses real people, and real people are not always easy to love. And in that first church, not everybody in that congregation was easy to love. There were hard, rough experiences. And, and, and I remember this kind of idealism about life and coming back from seminary and ready to lead and folks not being interested in my view of things. I remember that very clearly. I remember having to learn uh, about being in a relationship and being a leader of a congregation and always staying connected um, we, we tried a lot of things. We did a lot of things that were, were interesting. And, and uh, I, now I've learned a lot of lessons. I've done, I do a lot of things differently, I know, in that first experience today. But, but there were a lot of loving things that happened there. One of the, you know, I, I try to do a sermon each year where I kind of share funny experiences in, in ministry. And, and one that kind of came up to me a few weeks ago that I, I, I realized I have never told anybody. I've never shared with anyone. And, um, you know, UMWs can be a bit possessive of things. I don't know if you've ever realized that. But in the life of the church, it, it happens. And, uh, and I, I learned the, the lesson because... Uh, there was a UMW drawer in the, the kitchen, and um, 
You know, nobody ever opened the UMW drawer except UMW members. And, um, and I remember, though, coming up one, one day when UMW was meeting, they were getting ready to have lunch, and I was coming to say hi and walk through the kitchen, and, and um, the lady said to me, they said, Scott, we need to do something. Um, a mouse has moved into the UMW drawer. Uh, I guess didn't know he wasn't supposed to be in there. I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> So the, and they said, if you open the drawer, you'll see him. He's sitting right there in the corner, the front left-hand corner of the drawer. And we, we gotta get him out. We just can't have him in there. And I said, okay, if I open it, he'll be right there. And they said, yeah. And so I grabbed the tea towel that was right there and opened the drawer, grabbed him and squished him and then threw him into the trash can. And, and then I was never invited to another UMW function. But I, I fixed the problem, but I don't know. It, I, it was a little kind of scary at that moment, I guess. I, but we managed to make our way through, and, and I had some of the idealism of my faith bumped off in the midst of it and continued to serve as a pastor and, and helped lead and try to shape the church as the Christ-like, the Jesus community of who Jesus was in my life kind of doing a good job, I thought. Evidently, the cabinet thought so. And, and I got appointed to, to go to Wesley, the university church for Oklahoma City University. And, 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 and that, that meant something to me. It, uh, as a student at OCU, having that connection, it, it, it really was a, it, it, it was a powerful thing for me to be able to go and to serve as the, the pastor there. The problem is, in the 1960s, Wesley had had 1,000 members. At that time, their pastor was also the mayor of Oklahoma City. I bet you didn't know that. We had a Methodist pastor who was also mayor of Oklahoma City. Uh, he didn't tell the bishop he was gonna run for mayor. He was then president of OCU, and so the bishop didn't like it, so he moved him to be the pastor at, at Wesley. It took him out of uh, OCU. He, he then left and went to be the pastor, or went to be the president of another college after that. But, um, at, you know, big church at that time. By the time I got there, they were down under 250 in worship attendance, and, and it was struggling. Uh, but it still was a high status place to be. In a way, it kind of represented making it in, in my career. And that felt really good. And in that, after the first year, about the end of that first year, uh, my father passed away. And um, I kind of threw myself into the work in the church, a uh, lot of work in the church. I uh, work in the community. I was selected as the distinguished alum for OCU School of Religion. That was a, a nice thing. I, we, OCU situated in the Asian district and working with city council and the Asian community to help uh, do all that renovation. If you drive down Classen Boulevard, we, 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 we designed all that and put it together to, to, to celebrate it as the Asian district. It was um, awarded as the Vietnamese person of the year by the Vietnamese community. I'm not Vietnamese, but uh, they selected because I'd worked so hard and invested myself into the community. And, and during that time, I, I came through what I would say was my midlife crisis. Uh, my father's death, I was 36 years old, kind of come to some place, I was elected to be a representative of Methodists from Oklahoma to General Conference, and, um, and it was kind of like, is this it? Is this what it's all about? And, and began to really struggle with my own faith and the church. Um, things were going okay at the church, but it was you know just against overwhelming odds trying to make a difference in a church that had lost 75% of its attendance in 20 years. And um, trying to, thinking it was my job to save the church and to turn it around. And it wasn't always turning around. Some parts would turn, but other parts wouldn't. And, um, and it was a struggle. It was when I realized that for the first time, I, I kind of lived like a Pharisee. Um, I, I knew the gospel, the grace was there. 
for those who needed it, but I didn't feel like I needed it to that point in my life. I felt like, I, this sounds pretty arrogant, I know, but, but I felt like I had, uh, it, it's our responsibility, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected, Jesus said. And I felt like much was expected. Much was riding on my shoulders, and I was the one who was to carry it. And I wasn't doing a very good job of it. And my dad's death, and it just felt like the world was overwhelming. And in that time, I kind of finally realized that grace was there for me as well. You know, it's, it's weird to be a pastor and to be in ministry at that point for over 10, 15 years and finally realize that grace is a gift for you too. It was always something for other people who needed it whenever they got to the place where they couldn't do it or when their life was broken. But now it was there for me. And the first time I began to understand that. And I began to understand Jesus in a different way. I began to understand him as, as my savior, as one who was there for me. And it was a growing time for me. It was a growing time because uh, lots of things were not going the way I wanted. And I began to find in that moment that it wasn't my job to hold it all together. And so I began to grow in that. You know, if I'd have really taken to heart uh, the lessons of Methodism and John Wesley, you remember that John Wesley, he'd been a pastor for a long time before he came to that moment where he said, I really knew that he went to that meeting at Aldersgate and he heard them reading from uh, the, the preface to the Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And he said, and I knew for the first time that I was truly saved and that God was there for me. And he knew that in that moment. After all those years of being a pastor, he finally got to that place. I should have known. I should have known that, that maybe I would need that as well. And so I moved through that time of trusting and building my relationship with him in a way that was deeper than I had known before. Um, more recently, that's even grown in a way that's, that's become even fuller. Then the Eastern Orthodox Church, they're usually built as a dome, the, the congregation, the sanctuary. So here we have it built like a nave. The reason we have this kind of shape is that it's like a boat. This image of the ship uh, is one of the early images of the church. And so this is the, the nave that we are in, being carried as a, a ship in the navy. Um, it's a part of church architecture that we're, we're a part of that. But in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's, it's always built as a dome. And in most of those, when you look up, what you see on the top of the ceiling is this image of Jesus that's called the Pantocrator, the Pantocrator. And that's in, the, in, in Protestantism, we rarely talk about this kind of stuff. But that image is understood as the ruler of all or the sustainer of the world, the redeemer of the world, the one who holds it all together and makes sense of it. And that's my understanding of who Jesus is these days. It's grown more back from my reliance and dependence upon him to one where we all are reliant and dependent upon him. And that Jesus is the one who sets it right and makes the world hold together and make sense of, 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 of who we are. That for those whose lives are broken, even though they may not know it yet, Christ has reconciled them to God and that they have the opportunity to be made new again. That he is the one who is the sustainer of all of it and will hold it all together and I think will reconcile all of creation back to God Jesus is that. He is the Pantocrator. Today, I'm a lot less focused on understanding my faith. I'm, I really am not interested in understanding it. 
what I'm really interested in is in experiencing it, in trusting, and following. Just experiencing the grace of God in the community of God and trusting his love for us and following his direction in our lives. That's really what I'm interested in these days. I, I, I'm not interested in great theological concepts. I was at a time. It's not me today. I'm just interested in experiencing and trusting and following. And I trust that as I continue to move in life, I'll come to know him in other ways, in other experiences. And maybe I wanted to share this a bit for those who are uh, at pivotal moments in graduation, moving from one place in your life to another. I want you to know that the answers you've been given in faith have been the answers that you've needed for the time in which you have come through. And that you'll face new places where you're gonna need different sets of answers in your life, and they're there. There are those who've experienced it, and it's there in scripture, and it's all around us. And you'll come to moments where you'll realize this faith that I had as a child is no longer working and I need something that's more grown up. Trust that it's out there. Trust that it's out there so you can continue to search and practice and find your grounding in him because it is there. And we can all trust in who he is for us. If I ever sound like I'm talking about myself to be just be talking about myself, um, then either I've gotten off track or you're misunderstanding my point. The way that I think we often come to understand our own lives better is through hearing the stories of others as they go through. And so maybe I just lay bare a bit of my own self journey so that you can help see who God has been for you. And you can trust who he will be for you into the future. Amen.